to the TFs and uh, even to me by email, uh, the, the type of social epigenetic or epigenetic control we were talking about is a subset of the gene by environment interaction idea. So one way in which you get a gene by environment interaction is via epigenetic control, but it's not the only way. There are a number of ways. And that's why those two concepts were treated as distinct. Okay? So there are ways in which the, your environment may, may affect whether or not you express a particular gene and whether a gene may affect whether you uh, respond to a particular environment that transcend or are distinct from the kinds of epigenetic mechanisms that we discussed, okay? The details, the biological details aren't important. The general principles that there can be a conversation between our biology and our, soci and our sociology is the most important idea, and that there are a variety of time horizons and a variety of uh, sort of uh, phenomenologic instantiations of these, this idea, that's the main important uh, uh, thing. Uh, I want to take a little bit about the final project, uh, which we're going to be distributing a week from today, um, as, as if prior students have uh, taken this project, and um, we uh, you know, have perfected it over the years, we're going to make a couple of changes. This is an open book, open note uh, project. And no extra reading is required or expected. So if you've done the reading for the course, we do not expect any de novo research whatsoever. Uh, you, are, you can. You can look up whatever you want to look up. You can read whatever you want to read. But it's absolutely not required. It typically doesn't improve performance uh, on the question. So usually you can answer the questions solely. Not usually. You can answer the questions solely based on the readings and lectures uh, from the class. Sometimes for the problems, and we have all past exams are online, all final exams going back like 10 years, you can look them up if you want and get a sense of where we're headed. Uh, and um, often we will assign for some of the questions like a little something to read, like a, like a newspaper article or, or a art, uh, some kind of journal article or something like that, and uh, we'll provide it. So you just read this and now answer the question in some regard. Uh, you have to work on your own. Please do not collaborate, collaborate with others in answering these questions. Don't discuss them with others. Do not plagiarize from others from past exams or from other sources. We often use uh, sort of plagiarism detection software. I really hate the fact that I have to remind you guys of this, but it leads to a lot of unpleasantness. If you're panicking, you feel like your life is ending because of this examination, don't cheat. When you are in a dangerous situation like that, you make stupid decisions which have long-term consequences at this stage of your life. I've been working with undergraduates for a long time. I was an undergraduate. Just resist the temptation to make a stupid move. Reach out to me, reach out to a TF, reach out to your resident dean. There are better choices you can make than to just say, oh, well, I won't be caught. I'll just grab you know, my roommates from last year's uh, essay answer to something else, or I'll cut and paste this Wikipedia entry and I won't attribute it. Just please don't do that, okay? It's just, it's just really unpleasant. Um, this final is broadly synthetic of the entire course, okay? So the questions will be much broader than the ones in the midterms. So There'll be something like, you know, how does structure and agency work across these many domains? Or please interpret, you know, social factors and how they affect blah, blah, blah. Or how is this idea in tension with that idea? Uh, it'll be things like that that, sh that typically will require you to integrate ideas from throughout the class or readings or points that we've been discussing from multiple lectures. So I just want you to think when you answer these questions. 
Uh, it's going to be roughly 14 pages of writing, 12 to 14 pages of writing, double spaced across <coughs> two questions this year, um, actually last year too, with some choice. And probably this year we're going to give you the option to pick one question from each of three triplets. So they'll be pick one from these three questions and one from these three questions and answer uh, those questions. So you'll have plenty of choice about what to answer. Uh, these are, will be blindly graded by the TFs. Then you're, they'll be reviewed by your section TFs, actually your whole performance. And I will personally review everything uh, before we assign final grades. We're probably going to post the exam, almost certainly we'll do this, on the course website at 5 p.m. a week from today, so after the last uh, lecture. And we will want your response to be returned to us uh, and these details we will give you more information about later, a week later, on April 30th by 5 p.m. We, uh, we won't take last exams. We have to grade 200 of these. They're very difficult to grade, literally five or six days. So please don't, uh, don't turn in uh, late work and assume you'll take it. Uh, we're going to have very specific instructions on hard copies like we have in the other exams. So typically we're going to set up on the last day, on the 30th, and also on the 29th. So we'll give you a two-day window to submit your exam in hard copy. You must submit your exam in hard copy, period. It is not okay to just upload it or email it to us and think that you've made the deadline. You have to physically show up on one of those two days and turn in the exam and be checked off uh, a list because we need to process the exams in all kinds of ways. You yourself don't have to show up. You can send your roommate if you want or your best friend from high school or your pet dog uh, can hand deliver the, or paw deliver the exam to Sam or one of the other TS. But somebody has to turn in a hard copy by the deadline and we'll also give you an extra day before when you can uh, show up. And there'll be very, very specific instructions about how to anonymize your exams and, and what face sheets to do and how to staple them. Please do not staple all questions together because we have to then disassemble your examination. And if you staple all, both questions together, we'll think you're only answering one question. Off it'll go, and four days later, the TF grading app will discover that, oops, here's the second question. So just read and follow the directions, which will be very, very clear. Any questions on the, on the final project? Yeah, what's your name? Joe, Joe, yeah. Uh, for the two questions, should it be around the same length um, per question? Yeah, if you can write as much or as little as you want. Please don't write more than seven pages. Don't think you'll impress the TF. If anything, you'll annoy the TF who's doing the initial grading because you know you've written ten or twelve pages and they're going to have to read more. So try to stick with the length. You're not going to be penalized if you go to eight pages. But if you start droning on and on and on, thinking well, I'll just do everything, you're just going to annoy them. So just stick to seven or eight pages. Six is fine if you want. If you can answer the question in less, that's, that's not a problem. But because they're independently graded by different TFs and are graded separately, it's not like, you know, like, oh, well, you wrote a lot on this question and less on that. So they're totally separate uh, exercises. Other questions? Just look at last exam, previous exams. We used to do kind of cool things, which I may do this year, but I don't think I can do. We, 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 it's always hard to figure out how to do these things that are, my purpose here is to give you guys, first of all, in the course of this course, different ways of showing that you know the material. So this is a totally different format than in-class exams which are timed, kind of put a premium on those of you that can answer questions quickly, have rapid recall. This is a totally different thing. Right here we want you to slow down, think, can you construct an argument, can you type it up in a way that we can read it. If you have bad handwriting, you're not going to pay a penalty here because you can type. And we typically often try to do something inventive. One or two years, years ago, we had students uh, pick two neighborhoods when I was in Boston, pick two neighborhoods in Boston and go and conduct an interview with a shopkeeper in each neighborhood and ask them about local social capital, for example, uh, and then write up those notes and report back. But I don't think we have the time, to, the way the exam schedule works at Yale, you guys just don't have the time to do something really cool like that. But we may come up with something that you know, will be an option. You don't have to pick it that'll you know, give you an outlet for some kind of cool exercise of some kind. Any, um, any more questions about the exam or the project? OK. Yeah? OK. All right. Um, so today we're going to begin this lecture and the next two lectures. We're going to kind of segue and kind of open up again to a broader set of concerns. We're segueing to begin to consider some of the moral implications of all of the things we've been discussing this semester and some of the policy implications. And we're going to start today in this transition with a kind of a quirky and kind of radical uh, set of ideas prompted in part by Harris's book, which was assigned uh, in the readings for today. 
Now, the merging of humans and machines is alternately described as utopian or dystopian uh, in both fiction and nonfiction. And actually, going back since science fiction was first a, a kind of phenomenon, people have imagined and speculated, I just need my pointer, people have imagined and speculated Imagine and speculate about these types of, uh, of unions. Or, for example, uh, states that are, that are between life and death. Or states that are between humans. I should change that. I don't know why it's in there. Uh, between human and machine. So, for example, you know, this is an old movie, you know, the, brain, the Brain That Wouldn't Die. Which, incidentally, who, which of you have been seeing in the news this German surgeon is planning on doing head transplants? Have you seen that? It's so freaky. It's, there's nothing, you know, in principle and conceivable about it. But uh, you know, I think in your lifetime we're going to begin to see like total body transplants, where presumably the head will be the owner of the new body, and not the body of the new head. Uh, you know, this is you know another old movie, and of course uh, uh, Shelley was concerned when she wrote Frankenstein, you know, about this kind of you know states between life and death. Uh, during Victorian England, there was a lot of concern about this topic. There was a lot of exhumation of bodies, the so-called resurrectionist movement. Uh, she was struggling with you know what is the difference between the life. Uh, death. And of course, other kinds of you know, movies or renditions, uh, both in fiction and nonfiction, sort of Born Borg, uh, which is one um, example, of, but a more recent and more interesting one is this book by Rebuilt, called Rebuilt by, uh, by Michael Chorost, or Chorost, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, and the title of the book is Rebuilt How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. And he had been severely hearing impaired since birth. Uh, when one morning in 2001, his remaining hearing suddenly and inexplicably completely shut down. And fortunately for him, this occurred at a time when cochlear implants had already been invented. And, uh, and they had progressed to the point where people who were formerly isolated from everyday sounds could actually learn to hear again, uh, literally learn to hear subtle sounds like the rustling of leaves as they walked through them. And so a tiny device was surgically implanted behind his left ear, uh, actually, what the cochlear implant does is it threads a little tiny wire through the cochlea. Remember, that's a little sh tiny shell-shaped thing that's in our ears that's one of the organs of hearing, the crucial, more biology, you don't need to know the details. But anyway, uh, and then it has a little transponder, and it goes through the skin, and then there's something put on the skin, uh, which is then this magnetic headpiece, which is then uh, connected to a wire to a speech processor that can be attached elsewhere on a person's body. But pertinently, as Koros describes it, his hearing wasn't restored, it was replaced. And his body, he felt, had now become part machine. And the implant was only the first step in the author's learning to hear again, as his brain struggled to interpret the new electrical signals it was, uh, it was receiving. So he was given basically a new sensory organ. It was embedded in his body. He saw himself as part human and part machine, and, uh, and, this, and this was, uh, uh, and, and he had to relearn, in fact, how to, um, how, how to hear uh, in this type of a new state that he was in. And there are other gray zones as well, not between, not between life and death or people and machines, but between people and animals. And this is baby Faye. In 1984, when I was just graduating from Yale, she received a baboon heart. A baboon heart was transplanted into her body, and she lived for 20 days in a process known as xenotransplantation. And there are prior examples of this. Of transplant surgeons have been fantasizing for years about the idea if we could only solve the problem of lack of transplantable organs because there are no sufficient human donors by getting organs from animals, this would be incredible, right? If we could get baboon hearts into humans. Or another example, in 1992, a pig liver was implanted in a human to buy time for a human organ, but the patient died 32 hours later. Desperate patients who are undergoing desperate procedures by desperate surgeons. Uh, in these types of situations. So Zeno transplantation, what is baby fate in this situation, part human, part animal, or not? And this is Marcus Rehm, a 25-year-old German long jumper. And he had his right leg amputated below the knee after a boating accident when he was 14. And he has since emerged as a world-class athlete anyway, winning Germany's national championship a year ago in July of 2014. And his situation is both inspiring and unusual. He actually has forced sports officials and a previous runner, uh, Pistorius, who 
unfortunately has been in the news for murdering his girlfriend more recently, uh, has forced sports officials to consider how to draw the line between able-bodied and disabled athletes. Do prosthetic legs simply level the playing field for Reed, compensating for his disability, or do they give him an inequitable edge via a kind of techno-doping? Now, it was unclear initially whether sports authorities would allow him to compete. And some have noted that athletes already modify themselves in numerous other ways, so why not let him complete, compete? For example, baseball sluggers that undergo laser eye surgery to enhance their vision, right? What's, if you can fix your eyes with laser eye surgery, why can't you replace your leg with this type of a device? Or pitchers who undergo a kind of procedure uh, of elbow reconstruction to give them sturdier ligaments so their, elbows and their elbow ligaments are now defective, we can do surgery on them and take tendons or ligaments from other, elsewhere in the body or operate on them, and now they become even sturdier than they were originally. Is that unfair? Why would we permit that? How is different than this example here? Or yet another example, what about, uh, for example, uh, transgender athletes? And since 2004, transgender athletes, who obviously have very substantial body modifications, have been allowed to compete in the Olympics. And in fact, at least three disabled athletes have previously competed in the Summer Olympics. So George Iser was an American who won a gold medal in gymnastics while competing on a wooden leg in 1904, uh, in the 1904 Games in St. Louis. Neroli Fairhall was a paraplegic from New Zealand who completed, competed in archery in the 1984 Olympics in uh, Los Angeles. And Marla Runyon, uh, was a legally blind runner from the United States who competed in the 1500 meters in the 2000 Olympics in Sydney. So we do allow people who are disabled to compete in the Olympics. We allow people who have had corrective and other surgeries of different kinds to compete in the Olympics. How is that different than this case? He lost his leg, we replaced the leg. How are we to draw uh, the line? Alas, a few days after winning his national championship, the governing body for German track and field announced that it would not nominate Rehm to its uh, roster for the European Championships, an honor that had historically been accorded uh, a guarantee to the national champion. And despite approving his participation in the first place, they said that they could not be sure that Rehm's prosthetic leg did not give him some kind of advantage. Now, he still may try to compete in the 2016 Summer Olympics, and his winning jump at the national meet of 8.24 meters, which is over 27 feet, surpassed an Olympic standard that was set for long jumpers trying to qualify for the 2012 games, and would have won a silver medal at the European Championships. So he's really an extraordinary athlete who can clearly compete at international levels, who is being denied the opportunity uh, to participate. These types of bodily modifications erase the lines between abled and disabled, and they raise philosophical questions. What should an athlete look like? Where should limits be placed on technology to balance fair play with a right to compete? And how do we define what it means to be human? Having a prosthetic thing inside you, having a foreign body inside you, being between life and death, between human and machine, between animal and human, uh, between abled and disabled, where are we going to draw these lines, and how is modern technology affecting where we draw these lines? The uh, International Olympic Committee has also recently taken a stab at defining which athletes count as women. Specifically, a recent ruling excludes females with a male range of androgen levels from competing. But interestingly, the IOC has given male range females an out. They may opt to medically lower their androgen levels. So some athletes might be taking the IOC up on its offer. This is Castor Semenya, who's a South African track star, and she's been receiving some sort of treatment in order to run in the, she received some sort of treatment in order to run in the London Olympics. And this is now, I'm quoting from a journalist. This is not what I'm saying. I'm quoting from a journalist. I'm quoting from a journalist. Okay, quote, either due to criticism or because of the new regulations or some other factors, Semanya no longer qualifies as breathtakingly butch, according to the Toronto star Stephanie Findlay, who now describes her as, quote, feminine. Quote, she wears a tight turquoise polo over her fit feminine body. Relaxed, poised, and it must be said, pretty, the young woman with an irresistible smile is almost unrecognizable from photographs taken during the height of the controversy, she writes, close quote. 
So, and indeed, if you look at these pictures, uh, this is Semanya, who was born with this body. She wasn't taking testosterone supplements and was required to reduce her natural testosterone to bring it into the female range in order for her to compete in the Olympics. This is the before and after photograph, and you can actually see the feminizing effects of lowering uh, the testosterone. In fact, similar things happen when you give men uh, f uh, female hormones and women male hormones artificially, you can reshape people's bodies. This is, of course, what's done in situations of transgender, uh, but also it's done in medical treatments of different kinds. But here, this woman's testosterone is being lowered artificially and is leading to the transformation that's shown here. Now, and indeed, her face has gotten rounder, her hair is longer, her figure is curvier, and it's, you know, obvious. However, whether fair or unfair, there may be something to the advantage line of argument. Maybe she was being unfairly advantaged by her naturally high uh, testosterone. Because Samania's performance times also look different after the estrogen treatment. She won a 2009 race with a time of 1 hour, 55 minutes, and 45 seconds by a 2 second margin. And this past year or last, or two years ago, she placed eighth in a race with a slower time of two hours and seven seconds. We're actually ruining her athletic performance by taking away her naturally occurring uh, androgens. And in fact, if you buy the IOC's logic about the unfair advantage of unnaturally high androgens, why not go whole hog? Why not test male athletes and bar males who have too high androgen levels or give them estrogen? to bring down their levels. I mean, why would the standard be applied, for instance, just in the women, but not in the men? They, men too, could have abnormally high uh, levels of androgen, which should be, you know, pruned by the IOC. Now, I'm mocking the IOC, obviously, but actually, they're, they are facing a dilemma of trying to decide what is a fair competition. Here's naturally occurring distribution. Now, we don't think about this when it comes to height. I mean, we think if you're born and you're seven feet tall, you get to be a basketball player. Someone like me doesn't get to be a basketball player. I like to think it's only because of my height, but alas, it's for many other reasons. <laughs> basketball, but I'm going to stick with a height argument. But you know, we don't. You know, what about other kinds of traits? And you need to open your minds and begin thinking about the, what it means to be human, and what our bodies, what is natural, what's unnatural, and how is that changing in your time, in your generation, because of technological advances, cultural changes, reshaping our ideas about what bodies can do and what they should look like. This is not a rare case, Samantha. Here's another example. This is Duti Chand from a different part of the world. And she loves her body, she says, just the way it is. Now, as a young teenager, she later reported, she was dismayed that her body lacked curves, that it was so masculine. But now, at age 18, she has no problem with it. And yet, in the summer of 2014, uh, India's, who, and Chan was India's 100 meter champion in the 18 and under category, she was barred from competing against other women because she too had a condition called hyperandrogenism, and her body produced natural levels of testosterone so high that they placed her in the male range in the eyes of international track and field. So following a ruling by the International Association of Athletics Federations, track's governing body, the Athletic Federation of India will allow Chan to restore to comp return to competition only again if she lowers her testosterone level beneath the male range. And she can do that either by taking hormone suppressing drugs or having surgery to limit how much testosterone her body produces. What was her response? F you. <laughs> her response was, no way. And she said, this is a quote, I feel that it's wrong to have to change her body for sports participation, she said. I'm not changing for anyone. And Chance and Samantha's cases are potentially more troubling than the others that we have been considering and will consider uh, and, and then more troubling than the Reed case, the, 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 uh, the athlete with the artificial extremity, because they are competing with a body they were born with. A purity that the uh, sports federations, uh, you know, um, and, and with, a, with a purity that the IAFF rule says is not allowed in her case. So aside from hormone suppressing drugs or an operation, her alternative is basically to quit running. And really, I think that's a really sad. But it draws the distinction, what's the difference between being born naturally with high levels of androgen, and if we permit that, would we permit women to start injecting testosterone to become faster runners? And if we prohibit that, why are we prohibiting it? What's the difference between having naturally high levels of androgen and artificially induced levels of androgen? 
And it's these types of examples, of course, that lie at the core of Harris's argument and the argument between Harris and Sandel that is summarized in the readings for today. Okay, what about this? What is this? Who knows what this is? I met today earlier with uh, Isla. Yeah, so what is this? You know what this is? A tech suit. Yeah, it's a tech suit, right? So what, 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 what's the purpose of this? It streamlines your body. It makes you really buoyant in the water. It's the rubber. Yeah, it makes you a really great swimmer, right? And, and uh, when these, and so actually, and now how is this different? If we permit the swimmers to wear this kind of a tech suit, why should we permit the swimmers from injecting uh, testosterone? And if we prohibit them from injecting testosterone, uh, you know, how do we draw the distinction between that and naturally high testosterone in, in women uh, or male athletes? And in fact, researchers from Speedo's Aqualab, its global research and development facility, approached the NASA Langley Research Center to conduct research on drag reduction of swimsuits because of the center's long history of wind tunnel testing on drag reduction for spacecraft and aircraft and boats. And working with aerospace engineer Steve Wilkinson, other US and foreign research organizations, and also Olympic swimmers, they developed the so-called laser racer swimsuit, this swimsuit here. And then in 2008, after the swimsuit, as soon as, of course, it's an arms race, as soon as one elite swimmer uses the swimsuit, I mean, this swimsuit would have no effect on me, obviously, but uh, uh, it might improve my appearance, but, uh, but, it, uh, but it will have a big effect on elite athletes like this. And as soon as the swimsuit was adopted, in 2008, an astonishing 108 world records in swimming were broken, 79 of them by swimmers wearing this suit. And opponents called the use of such suits a kind of technological doping. Well, what's the difference between this swimsuit and having a prosthetic reeves, uh, having a prosthetic leg? Can we draw a distinction? If so, on what basis are we drawing the distinction? This too lies at the core of the argument between Harris and Sandel that's summarized in the readings for today. So against this backdrop, let's consider the issue of human enhancement, its morality, and its regulation. And there are difficult questions related to the application of technology to human enhancements in areas as diverse as the following. Curing disabilities, health in general, longevity, intelligence. What about interventions that could change people's intelligence? Emotional control, aesthetic expression, spiritual goals, or ensuring the best lives for one's children. <laughs> Things that we might do technologically that might actually change and modify downstream the kinds of children we actually produce. And the question arises immediately, why would anyone oppose such enhancements? Would it be better to have shorter lives, more disabilities, less intelligence, less memory, less artistic ability, less happiness? I mean, how can you argue against those things? Why would we stand in the way of technological progress that might enhance human performance on these and many other sorts of domains? What's the difference between a cochlear implant and a bionic ear? Why are we willing to and accept it as reasonable that a person who loses their hearing should be given a technology which restores their hearing, but see it different if you that hear normally, I give you a bionic ear that improves your hearing? What's the difference between those two? We think one is restoring someone, but to what level are they being restored? Maybe they should be, maybe if I, my hearing is only average, I'd like to be restored to the hearing that's, you know, the maximal hearing that any human uh, could have. What's the distinction between cosmetic surgery and genetic enhancement? What if I can achieve attractive children by giving them plastic surgery versus doing some kind of genetic engineering in my germline to guarantee uh, better children? And in your readings, we have lots of troubling contrasts. For example, one of the arguments is, what's the difference between achieving control of diabetes with diet versus an internal insulin pump. If you're diabetic, you gotta control your sugars. What if I do it by having to regulate your diet, or I do it by inventing a device which measures your sugar, is implanted internally, and replaces your pancreas and, uh, and, and, and uh, provides insulin. And in fact, Sandel and Harris are arguing about this, and they begin to say, well, the person that, uh, that is managing their diabetes by, uh, by not using this device is somehow morally more virtuous. You know, that he or she is making more of an effort. And somehow that's the important thing. Or we haven't violated the purity of the body. You still have your body. Of course, if that's the case, what's wrong with poor child 
and, uh, and uh, Semanya, right? You know, that they had this naturally occurring uh, body. Or another example, what if I gave you the test, uh, the option of improving your SAT performance, either by a very painful, and all of you struggled with SATs and ACTs, a uh, very painful uh, Kaplan or Princeton review or whatever, a uh, test prep, and so weeks of struggling and, uh, and, um, and going to this and taking all the practice tests as all of you did, or Ritalin. You just pop a pill and you get a 100 point boost in your SAT performance. Okay, be honest. What would you pick? If you had to pick between one of those two, be honest. Who would pick weeks of Kaplan? Who would pick Ritalin? Okay, you have to vote for the love of God. I mean, I would pick the Ritalin too, right? I mean, to take, if, if it were the case that you take this one little pill, it's safe, let's say on one occasion, and you go in and you get a 100 point boost on your SAT prep, or weeks of test prep, I mean, you know, it would be pretty obvious. And this is the example that Kaplan, that, uh, Kaplan, that, uh, that uh, <laughs> I hate, I hate Kaplan, uh, that, uh, that Harris and, uh, and that Sandel are arguing about. Or what about weight loss via exercise versus plastic surgery or drugs? What if you hear about a friend of yours that had like, you know, um, had surgery, bariatric surgery to lose weight. You know, they were 300 pounds and they lost weight versus they went on an intensive regimen of exercise and diet and they lost weight. You probably think, ah, the person had surgery, they cheated. Why? Why do you think that? What's the difference between those two kinds of things? Is it relevant to the axis that we are considering? Or what about the example also discussed in the readings of musicians who use beta blockers to conquer their stage fright? Or the Supreme Court case of a golfer who needed a cart? Is, in fact, the essential aspect of the sport crucial as discussed in the case? And if we prohibit the golfer from using the cart, why do we not prohibit the golfer from having his wearing glasses so he can see where he's putting? Why is it okay to fix your vision, but not okay to repair your inability to walk by driving uh, in a cart? How are we making these distinctions? Are they just uh, capricious? Sandel provides the illustration, which I think is a very important and powerful illustration, of oxygen deprivation during runner's training. Now, many of you probably know that some of the best runners in the world come from particular parts of Kenya and other nearby areas of Africa, uh, and there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is that they train at a very high altitude. When I used to do karate when I was here at Yale, our sensei would have us wear um, heavy weights, five pound weights, on, uh, well actually two and a half pounds on each extremity, all four extremities, so on your legs. And he would have us spar with these weights, trying to punch and kick our opponents while wearing these weights. And we would do this for two hours, and then what he would do is something magical, he would take the weights off. And we felt like kings, like we could, you know, like we were liberated. Like this was an incredible fluidity. We felt like you know birds flying. It was an incredible feeling. So that's sort of what these runners do. They run at high altitude. They get accustomed to a low oxygen environment. Their body adapts to the environment. And what do you do when you have physiologically when you have low oxygen tension? There's a lower amount of oxygen in the air. Your body responds physiologically. You, your kidneys start producing more erythropoietin, which is a hormone that regulates the production of red blood cells. You pump up more EPO. When you pump out more EPO, you produce more red blood cells, and you get, uh, you get plentiful red blood cells, and now you take that person and you bring them to sea level, and you have them run the Boston Marathon. It's like taking the weights off a person that was uh, fighting the karate example I gave you. They feel like they're sailing, because their body can process oxygen so much more. Now, what's the difference between that and the following? You can't afford to go and run in Denver, so instead, in your backyard, you construct a tent and you artificially lower the oxygen in this little sealed tent, and you sleep there every night if you're a runner. And in, in sleeping in a low oxygen environment, you up the red blood cells in your body. That's the second option. Or third, you say, that's a, annoying and expensive, and I don't want to do that. Doc, just give me a shot of erythropoietin, and I'll produce more red blood cells. All three achieve the same objective. One, very naturally, by going to a high altitude and running or being born there. A second, by creating a tent that reduces the oxygen you're exposed to. And a third, by getting an injection. Why would we care about these uh, differences? And can you defend the difference uh, between them? So what is the difference between those two things? Three options for improving your running performance. What's the difference between those three? Nobody has any thoughts on this topic? Okay, hold on. 
Raise your hands if you did the reading. Okay, put your hands back down. How many, hand, how many people raise your hands? Half? Less than half? Less than half. Okay, do the reading for the love of God. It's, it's really, it's important. Okay, so what is, if you had done the reading, this would be an easy question. So among those of you that did the reading, who can answer what's the difference between those things? Yeah, Leah. Yeah, so effort seems to be important. So that's one axis along which those things are judged. Now, whether it's relevant or not is another issue, but effort. Yes, behind you. What's your name? Joel. Joel, yeah. Um, well, for the first one, depending, because the people already live in a high environment, they don't have to spend money. So there's, um, like, SDS doesn't give someone an advantage versus, like, getting a job. Okay, so that's good. So that's also good. Both were good. So, um, so what Leah said was good, and what you, Joel, right, just said? Joel? What Joel just said was good. One of the issues that comes up that we're going to come to in just a moment when we talk about this is one of the reasons we begin to feel uncomfortable about how these technologies are invented and deployed is our concern for widening disparities, right? Only rich people might afford these technologies. And this picks up a theme we've been discussing also throughout the course, how the introduction of new technologies paradoxically doesn't lower disparities, often increases disparities. So we might be very concerned that only the rich would have access to these new technologies, and that seems unfair to us. But of course, we could address that issue if we wanted to. We could make it free, for example. Other ways these are different. Yeah, Gianna. Um, in terms of paying their money, uh, I'm not sure I know the details of that, but I know that um, the government Okay, good. So they might actually have different physiologic implications. The EPO shot might be a temporary effect. Uh, and less natural is very focused. There may be many different things about running at high altitude, not just the response to the low oxygen tension, but other kinds of changes that occur in your body. And so this very narrow thing might be suboptimal for other reasons or have side effects from the medication. Other, no, there's one obvious thing that's the different among these three, which I already mentioned, and you can reproduce for me someone. The kind of effort involved, right? That kind of, so one seems like cheating. It's so easy, you're just taking a shot. And Harris's conceit, or consider Harris's conceit, of a school that achieves superhuman outcomes versus a technology that does it. And he asks, what's the difference? What if I could, instead of having you spit blood for four years at Yale, I'll just give you, like in the Matrix, the blue pill, or I forgot which one it is, the red one. Which one is the good one? I guess they're both, he defines them. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, what's his name? That guy. Morpheus. Thank you. Uh, Morpheus doesn't tell Neo, you know, what is the right choice. He just says, well, in one of them you can stay a slave, you can stay ignorant of the reality and be happy, and in the other uh, you can take it. Which one is that? Is that the red or the blue pill? The blue pill is to stay as you are? Yeah. Okay, one of you took the red pill. One of you took the red blue pill. Anyway, someone please email me which one it is so I don't have to look it up. Don't do it now, after class. Okay, so anyway, you take one pill and you stay like you were and take the red pill. Incidentally, which of you read uh, uh, the Iliad in 129, or 130 is it? It's 130, right? <clears throat> okay, what's Achilles' dilemma? What's Achilles' dilemma? Not with respect to whether he returns to the battlefield. When he's talking with his mother, Thetis. Yes? Uh, does he not go to war and be a uh, live forever but die off, or go to war, die, but be a legend forever? That's exactly right. This is an age-old dilemma. Does Achilles die a glorious death? And here we are talking about Achilles, who I'm convinced was a real person, thousands of years later, in a world he cannot imagine, but he died young. Or he says, better to live uh, as, a, uh, as the lowest uh, sod, uh, sod breaker on earth than to lord it amongst all the souls in the underworld, he says. Right? When Odysseus encounters him, uh, when he goes to the underworld in the Odyssey, I'm sorry, it wasn't in the Iliad, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus goes to the underworld and comes across Achilles. So this is an age-old dilemma. Do you take the red pill or the blue pill? Anyway, that's a digression and a digression. What I was talking about was superhuman <laughs> outcomes versus technology with education uh, versus technology. And Sendell's opening gambit that Harris accurately summarizes. Now, ordinarily, I don't assign readings where one person is criticizing another without allowing that person to speak for himself. But Harris, in my judgment, does a very fair job accurately summarizing Sandel's argument, and then in my judgment, eviscerates the argument uh, that Sandel uh, is making. So Sandel's opening gambit is to ask whether it is wrong to make a deaf child by design, and whether it is wrong to make a tall or smart child by design. 
Now, what will be the difference between those? Let's say you're a parent, you're deaf parents, and you say, we want our children to be deaf. Give us a, and there's a technology that allows that to happen. And many deaf parents feel this way, by the way. Or conversely, you are a normal parent, uh, and an average parent, let's say, for the population, and you say, I want my child to be tall. Give me a technology that will make my child tall. Is there a difference between those two? Yeah, what's your name? Emma. Emma, right. Yeah. What's the difference? Um, well, society generally regards being deaf as some form of disability where the other two are, be, are seen as being advantageous. So like, you could make the argument that the parents who want their child to be deaf are intentionally <coughs> harming their child's chance at the best life. Any arguments against that? Yeah, what's your name? Emma. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry, I wouldn't say it's an assumption. I think it, 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 it is worse to be deaf, but it, it's culturally loaded is what I think you are, right? I mean, there's, it's, it's a normative standard that, that we're saying. So your argument says, well, the majority gets to vote on what's normal, right? And your argument would be, well, no, hold on a second. Why should the, minority define, the majority define what's normal? And then if you want that, then you get to have it. But if you don't want that, you don't get to have it. Yeah, other differences? Yeah, Joel. I'm sorry, say that again, it's something what? So the child could I'm deaf now, yeah, say that. The um, child could have been deaf um, because of the getting genes from the parents, like, and they get the parents. Let's say the parents, no, no, let's say the parents acquired their deafness in adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jana. Um, so with the deaf parents, the motivation presumably is that they're trying to make their child fit into the society that they live in, and they want their child to conform to Well, no, but in the other society, I would say that, wait a minute, I'm in a society, unfortunately, with privileges height, and, uh, you know, I want my kids to be tall. I'm responding to the norm of this equally responding to the norm, and actually, optimal participation in my society is to be tall, and optimal participation in deaf society is to be deaf, and so each of us is being guided by local norms or whatever. So, so Sandel, so Sandel asked that question because he thinks what we're going to say is, is that it would be wrong to create a deaf child and that therefore there is something bad about implementing technologies that uh, corrupt or affect the human body in, uh, in such a way. And we, um, but, but this, these, these, this, the way in which these arguments by Harris and Sandel intersect with a lot of the topics that we've been discussing in the class is that heretofore we've typically been arguing that we can better ourselves by bettering our environment, but what about literally improving ourselves? What about deliberately intervening in the natural lottery and not just in the social lottery, as we've been discussing for the rest of the class. So here before, we've been talking about, whoa, is the social lottery, there are all these structural things that affect you, they affect you, and so forth. But now, what if you could intervene in the natural lottery? If I could do genetic engineering in you, and give you, or in, in utero, do interventions that actually resulted in you having a different kind of body because of a direct intervention in that regard. And after all, all the changes that we've been implementing in our culture have been modifying our genes anyway, as we saw two lectures ago. That is to say, there's already some way in which our culture is reshaping our genes. What would be wrong with us actively intervening over really short time horizons rather than waiting passively for the human race to evolve in some way over long time horizons? It becomes very, very hard to sustain an argument against actually these types of, uh, this type of genetic engineering. And actually, as far as I'm concerned, Sandel's argument ultimately boils down, let me put it this way, I'm very sympathetic to Sandel's argument I understand that he, you know, that he thinks there's something creepy and, and wrong with like making a deaf child deliberately or, or these technologies that might change the human germline. But actually, if you begin to think deeply about what Sandel is saying, the bottom line is his argument is just like, that's yucky. I mean, really, that's what he's saying. That's yucky. And actually, that's really not a good argument. You know, he just says, I don't like this. I don't like the idea that we might modify the human body. Uh, that we might take control in a godlike way of our evolution or our destiny. That's not a strong policy or philosophical argument. And as I said, in my judgment, Harris completely destroys the argument in his book. Now, Harris basically is a triumphalist, right? He's like a, you know, a guy that really believes in the, what, the, what technology can do to allow us to intervene in the natural lottery and reshape our bodies in a variety of ways. 
Well, let's look at the effects of these technologies. Here are some technologies that affect the human brain, uh, different kinds of brain enhancers, many of which you're already familiar with. Uh, so you can imagine that there's hardware and software, and it's internal and external. And for instance, internal software might be sort of maps and depictions that you might have. Uh, or here's uh, external software that you guys use all the time, you know, uh, sort of Wolfram Alpha or Google uh, or different kinds of uh, uh, communications uh, technology. Or external, you know, we invented writing. That's a kind of external hardware that we invented. Or internal hardware, such as drugs, for example. Or as I'll show you in just a moment, sort of uh, neural interfaces, sort of prostheses that people might have. You know, we've always been using different kinds of enhancers to affect our body. And we might ask how we can draw distinctions among them. For example, here's the external hardware category. In the past, it was pictures and writing. And now it's wearable computers and cell phones. So this is a type of external hardware that re extends my brain. I'm much smarter because of this device. Is it unfair that I have this device? Would Sendell take it away from me? Would he be right to take it away from me? And soon, we're going to have a kind of wireless exocerebrum shown in the lower left. That, or that's a very, not a, it's a very early stage on the way to something like that. I'll show you in a moment a better uh, example. <laughs> And eventually, maybe people won't just have Google Glass, which was recently uh, taken off the market, but maybe they'll have Google Lens, like a little, you know, which is frightening to me to imagine, like implanted into your eye, instead of wearing it on your eye, a little lens that constantly can have a little Google feed, like a science fiction movie, or the, or the book you guys read when you were in, uh, in, uh, in high school, that book Feed, I think it's called. Uh, may, raise your hands if you read this book in high school, a science fiction book, just some of you. Anyway, so imagine you had this little uh, Google lens implanted in your eye, and whenever you looked at something, if you wanted, you could just flick your eye and it would give you information about who you were looking at or when the next sub subway car was arriving or, or where Paul is. He's 400 feet away. You could turn around and walk away from poor Paul, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, or you can imagine here's external software. Calendars, internet search, data visualizations, expert systems, or, or biofeedback. Uh, or here's uh, internal software. The, what, you're, what's hap what I'm doing to you right now is equipping you with internal software. I'm teaching you stuff. Education is a kind of internal software. Or mnemonics, the little tricks that you use to memorize things. Or cognitive therapy that changes your response to the environment. Or meditation and concentration, uh, and so forth. And as I've been suggesting, people are beginning to think about, in your generation, Internal hardware. Drugs, of course, are an obvious example, but we'll eventually have gene therapies, different sorts of deep brain stimulation, different kinds of stem cell innovations where we can initially cure diseases like Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's and so forth, but ultimately change. So what starts as a cochlear implant and restores a disability becomes a bionic ear, which enhances human performance. We we'll may find similar things being deployed with respect to uh, brain enhancement or sensory prosthetics, or brain-computer uh, uh, interfaces of different kinds. So I want to just show you, this will take about four minutes, I want to show you a little excerpt from a clip from a colleague of mine when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. This is a man my age who, uh, who I knew when I was at the University of Pennsylvania during my medical training, and I completely lost track of him for 25 years until I stumbled on uh, this video. Once in a while, we run across a science story that is hard to believe until you see it. That's how we felt about this story when we first saw human beings operating computers, writing emails, and riding wheelchairs with nothing but their thoughts. Quietly, in a number of laboratories, an astounding technology is developing that directly connects the human brain to a computer. It's like a sudden leap in human evolution a leap that could one day help paralyzed people to walk again and amputees to move bionic limbs. As we first reported last November, the connection has already been made for a few people, and for them, it has been life-changing. Scott Mackler was a husband, father, and successful neuroscientist when he received perhaps the worst news imaginable. At the age of 40, he could run a marathon in three and a half hours, but it was about that time that he discovered he had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. His brain was losing its connection to virtually every muscle in his body. The near total paralysis would also stop his lungs. He didn't want to live on a ventilator, so nine years ago, he recorded this message for his two sons. 
I know the future holds lots of love and joy and pride, and if life goes on, I'll be watching you along the way. And I love you very much, and I'll see you. He wanted his sons to see him finish this running. This is Scott Packer today. His mind is sharp as ever, but his body has failed. Doctors call it locked-in syndrome. Scott and his wife, Lynn, learn to communicate with about the only thing he has left, eye movement. He'll look at you for yes right. and for no. And for no, he looks away. I see. It's cumbersome. It is. But recently, Scott found a new voice. Can everyone hear the PC? I apologize for the quality of the voice. Scott wrote these words one letter at a time with nothing but his thoughts and the help of what's called a brain-computer interface, or BCI. He wears a cap that picks up the electrical activity of his brain and allows him to select letters simply by thinking about them. Then the computer turns his sentences into speech. I hate being helpless, and when other people put words in my mouth, well, this is a very unusual interview for 60 Minutes. We've done something that we never, ever do, and that is we've submitted the questions in advance because it takes Scott a little while to put the answers together using the BCI device. Scott, I understand that earlier in the progression of this disease, you said that at the point you had to go on a ventilator, you didn't want to go on anymore. But today you are on a ventilator, and I'm curious about what changed your mind. Because I can still communicate. It isn't fast. It takes 20 seconds or so to select each letter. Scott told us it took him about an hour to write the answers to our 16 questions. But he writes well enough to continue his research and manage his lab at the University of Pennsylvania, where he still goes to work every day. You use this system even to text your sons, for example. And I wonder what it would mean to your life today if the system somehow was taken away from you. I couldn't work without BCI. Couldn't work without BCI. What does it mean to your relationship? Well, I, he's had... Unbelievable. MP PhD is still running his lab, right? I mean, that's a triumph of our civilization as far as I'm concerned. That we, and this technology will get better and better and better in our generation, faster and faster, more accurate. Uh, and give people like this an extraordinary uh, opportunity, being still productive in, in society. I had completely lost track of this man. And so it's really not science fiction. Incidentally, the same innovations that do this ultimately can be used for other purposes, such as reading people's thoughts, right? So instead of having the thoughts control the apparatus, you could kind of use analogous technology to go the other way. And you can imagine such devices eventually being implanted in people's bodies uh, in all uh, kinds of ways. So the basic idea is that there's some kind of electrical uh, detectors that are you know, implanted on the brain. No doubt there'll be new discoveries and new ways this is done uh, in the upper. Some of this work is being done at Yale, by the way. Uh, and then you know, the person you keep, they learn, just like the cochlear implant with the Charles that we spoke at the beginning, will learn actually to, re to train uh, what they do. And I didn't have time to show you today a video of a man, both of whose arms were cut off who is then actually given a device that reads electrical signals in his neurons that go down to his chest and learns to move these robotic arms by just his thoughts, by retraining his body uh, to use these kinds of devices between human uh, and machine. And the question is, is what we've been talking about a utopian or dystopian vision of the future? And again, this is what Harris and Sandel are arguing about. Here's some slides of, the, of, uh, of, of someone else's that summarize part of what some people foresee. Commercial entities that provide modifications of our genes and bodies, such as a fictitious company known as Human Upgrade. So here's an ad for this company, Human Upgrade, victory. And here's the, here's the pros on this advertisement. To lose, yes, I remember, that was before. To win, that is what forces humans to go to the edge. There is no better feeling than to conquer your enemies to be the best, to be the master. Be what evolution did not let you be, and make the step which leads you further than ever before for those for whom thrones were made. This is the ad uh, for this hypothetical company. And this technology contains an element of comparison. One upgrades to improve one's relative standing, another idea we discussed earlier in the course, which in fact is one of Sandel's objections. 
and one of sociologist and transhumanist philosopher Jane Hughes's concerns, and that Joel raised, which is what if only the rich can upgrade? So another element of this debate is the regulation and the social implications of this technology. Well, here's what you can buy if you want victory. Um, you can buy this extra finger. And I don't know if any of you have ever done stick fighting, but I used to stick fight. And I can tell you that actually having this extra finger would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> and actually, not just if you uh, wanted to be a stick fighter, but if you wanted to be a piano player. Right? Having an extra finger might actually be really terrific if you wanted to play the piano. Maybe you would buy or pay for this or pay for your children to have this technology. Or if you're a swimmer, you might pay for webbed fingers and webbed feet, which would actually be kind of a nice enhancement, even if very creepy. Um, or what about a simple tooth? No more awkward gaps between your teeth. Why not just have one uniform tooth that really performs optimally uh, with your eating or biting into fruits of different kinds, or what about uh, a kind of uh, simple nose? Uh, now you're getting grossed out. The extra finger was okay, but now this is too far. You know, why would anyone want a simple nose? And would we, <laughs> would we allow people to do this uh, to themselves? What about to their children? Would we allow people to pick a simple nose for their children? Would we allow them to make their children deaf? Would we allow them to make their deaf children hearing? How are we going to draw the distinctions between these things? What would happen to the society? And why do these images regarding human upgrade feel different than the prior taxonomy or than the image of Rem, right? The athlete. Why did you not go, ooh, when you saw him with a blade foot, but now you see this and you think this is kind of creepy? And should we think it that was creepy? And some such transformations are not as far-fetched, even given present technology. These are a couple of images from the internet. I think the, I think the guy on the left is Lizard Man, and the guy on the right is Cat Man. I think the guy on the right died. They've gone through extreme body piercing and tattooing to try to adopt these very different kinds of physical appearances using a very primitive uh, technology. We clearly don't prohibit people from doing that. Why would we prohibit uh, the use of other kinds of, of technologies? Or what about this case from the past year? Just a year ago, scientists uh, assessed the use of engineered vaginal organs in four patients aged 13 to 18 years who were born with vaginal aplasia caused by a condition I learned about in medical school and had not read about again since it appeared in the news a year ago, something known as meyer rokitansky Pusterhauser syndrome, the bane of medical student examinations. Uh, <laughs> and in this condition, a girl's born with this condition, they have a, a, an opening to their vagina, but there's no uh, you know, vaginal uh, canal. And what these scientists did, these surgeons did, published in The Lancet a year ago, is they obtained a vulvar biopsy of autologous tissue from each patient and then cultured, expanded, and seeded epithelium and muscle cells onto biodegradable scaffolds. Huge amounts of science went in to doing all of this work, developing the scaffolding, developing the extraction, figuring out how to culture the shells, the, the cells, getting the layers to line up uh, correctly. Really a triumph as far as I'm concerned. And they were able then to do this and recreate components of expected vaginal tissue and then uh, what they did is, is they made artificial uh, vaginas, and, they, and those vaginas uh, matured in an incubator, and then they were surgically implanted uh, into these young girls, age 13 to 18, and the girls were followed for eight years. And they had yearly biopsies, which showed the physiologically correct three-layered uh, structure of the vagina, consisting of an epithelial cell-lined lumen, surrounded by a matrix and then a muscle, and the other expected components of vaginal tissue. MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging uh, of the patients, demonstrated that the engineered organs uh, were fine and there were no abnormalities after surgery. And this was also confirmed by yearly uh, vaginoscopy. And then they gave the young women validated self-administered female sexual function index questionnaires, which showed variables in the normal range in all areas tested, such as desire, arousal, lubrication, orgasm, and satisfaction, and painless intercourse. So, how can we object to this technology? And what if then we, if we invented this technology, we invent, let's say, an artificial uterus that initially replaces the uterus of women who lack a uterus because they're born without one or they lose it due to trauma. And then having invented that technology, just put that uterus on a shelf 
and then let people buy access to rent an artificial uterus so they don't have to carry babies anymore. The baby can be born in a machine. I think there's a good chance that in your lifetime, it'll become possible to gestate babies extracorporeally using technologies of this kind. Now, we need to think about this. I'm not, I'm not like some kind of technophile who thinks, oh, it doesn't matter. Full steam ahead, any technology is great. But I am not, I, I believe that to restrain the technology, we need sounder arguments than it's yucky or it offends my conscience. We need to really understand the distinctions if we're really going to make a stand about the uh, development and deployment of some of these uh, technologies. And in fact, some of these changes can actually occur naturally. In January of 2009, baby Kamani Hubbard was born in Daly City, California with six fully formed and functional fingers and toes on his hands and feet. And this is known as polydactyly, nice Greek word, and it's not an uncommon genetic trait, but this particular case was extraordinarily remarkable and rare. His dad, Chris Hubbard, a 34-year-old postal worker, noticed the spectacularly rare case of polydactyly at birth. Six perfect fingers on each hand and six perfect toes on each foot, which went well beyond the general trait that ran in his family. Some family members had had six fingers, but not completely developed the six finger. And no one had ever had six toes in his family. In fact, Chris Hubbard himself, the father, had nubs of six fingers removed as a child, as these non-functioning digits routinely are. But what would you do if this was your child? Would you remove the extra fingers and toes or let them be? What would you do? Raise your hands if you would remove the extra fingers and toes. Raise your hands if you would let the fingers and toes be. Raise your hands if you don't know what you would do. It's not easy to know what to do. Do you conform to a social construction of what a normal body is and remove the extra fingers and toes? Or do you say, oh my god, my son is going to be an incredible pianist. The <laughs> fingers work. He's like Semanya and, and, the, and uh, what's her name? Uh, Ch Chad, I forgot her name, a chant. Uh, why not let him keep his fingers and toes? I mean, he'll be an incredible stick fighter. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really un unbelievable. So, um, so these are not easy decisions to, uh, to make, but these types of occurrences challenge us to think deeply about the kinds of dichotomies that we might imagine. And there's actually a social and intellectual movement in favor of embracing this technology, and it's known as transhumanism. It's an intellectual and cultural movement and a set of ideas that affirms the possibility and, in fact, the desirability of transcending the limitations of the human body through applied reason especially by using technology to eliminate aging and enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacity. Now, transhumanists see themselves as humanists who emphasize, who emphasize what we have the potential to become through reason. And yet, all of these technologies, as sociologist Jay Hughes argues in a wonderful book, which I stopped assigning because it was too much reading, but a book called Citizen Cyborg, raised important political questions which he argues, I think correctly, are best resolved by a democratic processes, which he also argues will create novel political coalitions. So you will find crazy coalitions between right-wing libertarians, disabled individuals, and you know, wealthy technologists who say yes to the technology. Or you'll find environmentalists with, you know, sort of, uh, with uh, finding common cause with uh, sort of, uh, uh, people with strong religious beliefs that actually say no to the technology. So he believes that these technologies will actually lead to reshaping of political alliances in our society. But the more important argument he makes is that actually what we need as we invent these technologies is to couple them with democratic control. We need a kind of deliberative process that allows us as a society to debate and discuss which technologies we will invest in, which technologies we will regulate, and how will we regulate them, and who, going back again to Joel's question, who can have rights and access to this technology? Will the government pay for artificial vaginas or prosthetic limbs only for certain people and not for other uh, people? And the movement is partly based on the argument that human traits actually have no clear beginning, evolutionarily speaking, and therefore, in fact, may have no clear end. 
And in fact, even over the course of my education, when I was sitting in your chair, there were all these absolute set. Well, humans are the only animal that have language. That's fallen away. Humans are the only animals that uh, make tools. That's gone away. Humans are the only animals that have self-awareness. That's gone away. Literally, every single br bright line distinction that's been made between humans and other animals has fallen away uh, because of the work of physical anthropologists and ethologists over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And specifically with respect to apes, they exhibit almost all the alleged capacities of human nature. Self-awareness, language, morality, some beautiful work done here at Yale by David Rand and his collaborators, and also by um, uh, Lori Santos. Uh, uh, who here is taking sexy sight? Okay, so her, uh, empathy, and, uh, and tool use. All of these things are seen in our primate uh, um, cousins. And the emergence of new technologies, in fact, has always and uh, will always raise problems by blurring boundaries between deeply felt cultural categories like these. Part of the problem, part of the reason these technologies cause us problems, make Sandel feel like it's yucky, and make Harris say, no, these are false dichotomies, is that we have cultural categories that draw bright line distinctions which we don't like seeing fuzzied up between animals and humans, and humans and machines, and the living and the dead, and the natural and the artificial, and between women and men, and between the young and the old. And these technologies blur all of those distinctions, make it harder to sustain dis differences between these sorts of categories. But the technology has the prospect for substantially affecting our bodies, our health, and our society. Whether we want to embrace the technology or not, Given its inevitability, we need to have ways to decide. So regardless of what we want, it's coming. So I think the real issue we have to discuss is what are we going to do about it? How are we going to confront the inevitable progression of these types of technologies? And in fact, consider the possibility that, as I introduced in one of the first lectures of the class, there might be a fifth phase of the health transition, that we may be beginning now a new phase after the fourth phase of the health transition, a phase in which we're going to start having increasing longevity and changes in reproductive patterns through the application of human technology and reason uh, in this kind of era. And that 200 years from now, someone lecturing in this, in this hall will say, and then we had this other phase where the technology totally changed you know, what happened to demographic patterns that had previously been extant since prior to the Industrial Revolution uh, and afterwards. So here is the argument. If the goal is OK, do the means justify it? And to summarize, basically in a, in a way that you all probably appreciate, Sandel is a deontologist, and Harris is a utilitarian. So Dan, raise your hand if you've heard the issues of deontology and utilitarianism before. Higher, so I can see. About a third of you, maybe? OK. This is a very important set of ideas that you should not escape Yale without having understood and studied. Not by me, you need to take another class to understand this fully. But briefly, the difference is as follows. We're trying to figure out how do we decide a right course of action. From the point of view of deontology, the idea, is, the idea is that the moral worth of an action depends on the rightness or wrongness of the actions themselves and not on the rightness or wrongness of the consequences of those actions. Deontology privileges the duty or obligation inherent in certain courses of action. That's Sandel. He says we can make, from first principles, arguments about whether this technology is desirable or not desirable. Harris is a utilitarian. He, that is the idea that the moral worth of an action is solely determined by its contribution to the overall utility in maximizing happiness or pleasure as summed among all persons. It is a form of consequentialism. The moral worth of an action is determined by its outcomes, and the ends justify the means. What Harris says is, I don't care about all that other stuff. What I care about is it making people better off. If it's making people better off, the that's yucky argument just doesn't hold water for me. And in fact, Sandel's major objection is that genetic enhancements represent the triumph of will over giftedness. He seems to prefer fate over choice. And he seems to think that there's something intrinsically moral about that which is natural. He suggests that designed children are somehow less than fully free, though he acknowledges limitations in his arguments. And he raises the specter of eugenics 
to argue against genetic engineering without adequately exploring the similarity and differences between the two, in my opinion. And Harris doesn't just say that Sandel is wrong. Harris goes a step further and he says, actually, we have a duty to engage in the development of genetic engineering and this technology. He says there's a positive moral duty to enhance. And he is OK with the idea of us, quote, ceasing to be human as we now understand the term. And his argument is a greater good argument. He says, you know, so what if we're not human in the same way in 200 or 1,000 years because we've invented the technology? That's OK. So Harris is, falls squarely within the arguments being made by the transhumanists like uh, Hughes and others. So here's some key questions that are raised by the readings, which I'm going to leave unanswered for you guys to discuss. What's the difference between using the technologies to cure disease or to acquire superhuman powers? Why is self-modification through self-control different from self-modification through technology? Why should things that lie between be morally problematic at all? And do technology and democracy go together? And if so, why should they go together? How can we answer these questions in a thoughtful and deep way? Things I think you should are worth the trouble uh, to think about. Americans' aversion to reward without merit, Americans have an aversion to reward without merit to what they see as effortless reward. And Sandel argues natural gifts and the admiration they inspire embarrass the meritocratic faith. They cast doubt on the conviction that praise or rewards flow from effort alone. Despite saying that, however, Sandel still admires natural gifts because they're natural and because they somehow have some kind, he believes, of intrinsic dignity. And yet, as we saw with the Samania case, she had a natural gift of having high testosterone, and yet somehow that was seen by the Olympic Committee as being unnatural and not to be admired. So not very consistent in that regard. As I said, democracy, Jay Hughes argues in his book, Citizen Sideboard, is needed to control these technologies. And in fact, in some ways, I would argue, democracy and science and technology together have been the principal sources of the rise in human welfare over the last 400 years, and maybe over the coming 400 years as well. Yet again, a coupling of social change and technological change over the last 400 years, which are really together at the core of improvements in human that's it for today. Any questions? Okay, see you next time.